Okay, howdy everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is what we're calling lesson number one. There will be a series of lessons on high power rocketry. And um, here's what I would like to do. Uh, I am recording these things so you can share the recordings uh, with the people who are not able to be here, if that would be useful. Otherwise, you can just tell them what we did and not necessarily have them spend an hour looking at the recording. There will definitely be things to do by you and your teammates before we see you again. And so each of these lessons, there will be activities in vocabulary and homework. And the homework is what we would like you to have done before the next time we meet. Our intention is to meet at this time of the evening um, for about five weeks in a row, followed by one week approximately of individual meetings with the individual teams. We're gonna call those the safety checkout meetings, at which point you should have a rocket basically completed. So um, let's, I'm getting a message. Ooh, chat, can you keep an eye on the chat, please? Okay, so um, here's what I'd like to do. Um, for those of you who just joined us, please add your institution to uh, the back end of your name so that we know where you're from. Thank you. I think I will not watch the chat, but rather try to have Sophia who's here with me watch the chat. Okay, again, welcome, here we go. So uh, my name is James Flotten. I teach here at the University of Minnesota in the Aerospace Engineering Department. And um, I do NASA promotion basically at the college level around the state for the Minnesota Space Grant Consortium. And so this particular set of lessons and the materials that you have received, and you will receive a few more of them, uh, are being paid for by Space Grant. And this is supposed to be an educational opportunity. And so again, welcome. Um, I have in the room with me, Sophia Vedvik. And so I think what I'm gonna do, rather than have her even turn on her microphone or her uh, video, is I'm just gonna spin this code, oh, never mind. <laughs> I, that's here. Never mind. I'm going to switch to a different video camera. There we go. Okay, so Sophia's here. And why don't you introduce yourself? Speak up. Hi, I'm Sophia. Um, so I guess I'm the TA for this course. I'm a first year graduate student um, in the aerospace engineering department here. Um, I did get my bachelor's degree here at the university as well in aerospace engineering. So I've been around for a while. Um, I, during my undergraduate uh, years, I also participated on the University of Minnesota rocket team. And I specifically participated in the uh, uh, Minnesota Space Grant Consortium uh, Midwest competition, which is how I uh, formally met Dr. Flatten. Um, so all four years I participated on the rocketry team and um, this fall, uh, Dr. Flotten asked me if I wanted to help out with this uh, remote rocketry course and I thought my skill set would really apply. And so I'm really excited to uh, work with you all and build rockets. Okay, thank you. So um, here's what I'm gonna do next. I'm, I'm actually going to just ask anybody who's willing to turn on their video camera to at least do so. And if you're from the following institution to wave at us, just so that we know that you're there and that you can hear me. Um, so let me just run down the list of names. I'm looking up at a whiteboard here. So Bethel participants, can you wave at me please? Bethel, okay. So I see a bunch of people from Bethel, that's great. Um, Augsburg, so Anissa is representing Augsburg tonight, that's fine. Normandale, who's on from Normandale right now? Okay, several people from Normandale, excellent. Remember to add your uh, institution if you haven't done so to your name, thank you. Duluth, it looks like you got a bunch of people in the same room. Super, oh man, they're excited. Okay, that's great, Hamlin. Okay, we've got several people from Hamlin, that's wonderful. Century College. Super, I can see several Century people, that's great. And uh, Fond du Lac. Okay, so, oh boy, there, there are more of them than there used to be. There used to be two, and now I see at least three. That's great. Uh, Inverhills? Okay, got a couple of people from Inverhills. Wonderful. So um, here's the plan. The plan is for us to go very fast through a bunch of material um, and look at a few things that are here in the room with us. 
and to show you where a bunch of materials have been posted and then to encourage you, to encourage your teammates, if they're not all here, to, um, to go through these materials and do the exercises that we're going to suggest um, between now and next time. So the first thing I need to do is to tell you where to find these materials. So I'm going to put into the chat a link. And then I'm going to go to that link myself right now. OK, so this is a very, very, very not fancy place to post stuff. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there already. OK, and so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm actually just going to take a quick look at this list and tell you what to expect. And I'm not going to go into all these documents, but just starting at the top, here is a, a document that has some animations of motors burning. That's very cool. We might get to that, we might not. Uh, Arcus is the name of a rocket. And so these are instructions to build a rocket. This is not the rocket we're building, but um, if you wanna see instructions for various rockets, it's not a bad idea to read various instruction books. This uh, Barrowman paper, um, is sort of an optional reading about center of pressure. We'll talk about center of pressure in a few minutes. This is the rocket we're building. So here are the instructions for the Binder Design Excel Dual Deploy Kit. Um, and if I click on that, basically here are the instructions. This is one of the things you don't have yet. And the reason is when we got the wrong parts, they sent us the wrong instructions, not unexpectedly. And so I have now received the uh, proper um, parts and instruction booklets, but I've already posted the instruction booklets, so you don't have to even wait for those. On the other hand, Sophia is collecting e uh, mailing, standard mailing addresses um, so that we can send out the remaining parts, some of them anyway. And um, so if you haven't given her, in fact, Sophia, do you know who has not provided you with a mailing address at this list of eight schools? Uh, Century. I need a mailing address from Century College, please. Uh, send that to Sophia so we can mail you the parts that you're missing. Um, and then here is photographs of that kit. And so frankly, you have many parts, but you're missing this piece because this piece came for the wrong rocket. So it was not this long and you're missing these instructions. So we will get you this piece and these instructions. And so if you want to know what the kit really should have looked like when it first came, here it is. And you will have all these parts very soon. Um, I'm just list going down the list here. Um, this is a, a boost coast descent figure. I'll pull it up in a minute. Here's a calculation of center of gravity and center of pressure done by hand. And then here are some slides about that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Here are pictures of what's in your tote. We'll go through what's in your tote in a moment. Um, lesson one, lesson one, lesson one vocabulary, lesson one homework. If I click on the homework document, I think I'll click on that and leave it open on my screen. This is the document that says, here is what we would like you to do. First of all, it gives the link that you are, that I'm looking at. And then it says, we'd like you to take a look at the two books that were in your tote. Or if you took these lessons some years ago, I might not have given you new books. There should be books on your campus already. And in particular, I'd like you to look at chapters one, two, and 11 in the high power rocketry book. The other book is more serious and it's about model rocketry. And it's kind of a prerequisite. So frankly, you should read that entire book. I'm just joking. You should take a look at the model rocketry book and then read these, at least have somebody on your team read these chapters in the high power rocketry book. Um, you should also go over your tote carefully all the way through and make sure that you can find all the things we say should be there. And if there aren't, if anything is missing, my apologies, let us know so we can add them to the box that we're gonna mail to you shortly. And then um, we're gonna be looking at CP, CG, SM in a minute and there are more documents posted than we will have time to go through here. I would suggest you look at look those over and perhaps even read that Barrowman article. It's actually pretty good. Here's the actual exercise, the homework, and that is to practice doing some epoxy work. And so we'll get back to this, but it's what we call the thin can exercise where we want you to use a small amount of the rocket's epoxy, which is in your tote, mix it up, see how it is to try and assemble something with it and actually see how long it takes for it to start to dry. So you know how fast you have to use it once you fix it up. So that's the, the homework. I'm just gonna leave that nearby and pull out the vocabulary. 
The vocabulary is a long list only because this is our first lesson and I saw a few of you at least um, at North Branch. And frankly, we did some of this vocabulary already at North Branch, but I'm gonna start over again. I'm literally gonna walk through this entire long list very quickly and then encourage you to watch for these vocabulary terms as you do the reading and as you start building things. Just finishing up this list of what's posted, here's another instruction booklet for a Miranda rocket, a different rocket with some other in interesting characteristics. Here is the schedule, that's important. I'll go back to that in a moment. And then here's a list of some places where we buy stuff from. You don't need to buy anything right now because I'm providing you the stuff that you need for this build pretty much. Um, but uh, this would be a good place to know about as in, oh, if I wanna buy a fiberglass rocket, I wonder where I could get one. Oh, there, there is a rocketry vendor, a bunch of them listed that could possibly sell me one. Remote rocketry lessons, this is important. This is what we plan to do over the next few weeks. And so we're calling this lesson one. At the start of this document is my contact information and that of Sophia's. Um, lesson zero was the kickoff in North Branch. Some of you were there. And so basically at that location, you got your stuff. You saw some high power rockets being launched. Some of them didn't go so well. Some of them were very exciting. Um, and I guess the homework after that is, you know, get more people involved if you don't have enough. So, um, and then make a decision about who's gonna be on these lessons. Presumably you did that because you're here. This is great. So here's lesson one. And lesson one will be basically basic rocketry concepts and the, what's in the kit and the tote and some epoxy practice. And then lesson two, next week. Next week, we're going to build the whole rocket. Well, actually, we're not going to build the whole rocket. We're gonna talk about the entire build next week. And the reason is you need to spread this build out over several weeks and some things have to dry and some things have to be done first, and be done second, et cetera. We want you to know what the entire project looks like all next week. Um, so uh, be there for sure, for sure. Next week's a really important lesson. And then as you are building the airframe, as you're building the rocket itself over several weeks, we're going to uh, talk about other things, including how to simulate rocket performance, how to build your AVE and program the altimeter, which you don't yet have because I have them ordered and they haven't arrived yet. So hopefully they'll be here by early November and we'll be able to actually incorporate them into the rocket at that time. And then one more lesson talking about some final details finishing the rocket. And then lesson six will not be necessarily on a Tuesday evening, although it might be for some teams. I want to have a separate meeting with every single team, every different team, with your rocket completely finished and you talk through uh, what it is you built. Consider this sort of a safety checkout. And here's something that I would like you to think about. And uh, maybe I should do a poll on this rather than trying to have a general discussion, but I want you to think about whether or not you're willing to try to fly these rockets this fall. I haven't promised that to anybody. In fact, if weather is, <laughs> if weather is winter in December, this might not work at all, but we might have the chance to go to North Branch first thing in December, literally, and fly these rockets. I hope, I hope we fly them all, but I was sort of thinking we'd either fly them late fall, that's late fall, or else in the spring. And I think I won't insist that everybody choose one or the other. I think I will hope that everybody will choose one or the other. But um, if there is interest in flying the rockets in December, and frankly, if you're interested in going into the competition, which is sort of what to do all winter and all spring, I would suggest you try to get this rocket finished and flown in the fall. Um, We'll get back to this, but if we did that, it would probably be the first weekend of December, which is the 4th or the 5th of December, and we'd go to North Branch. That's where we are allowed to fly these rockets, and this would take us a few hours to get these things finished up and back. And So maybe we'll get back to whether or not teams are really interested in doing that. You should be done, but you don't necessarily have to go out in the wintertime to fly your rocket, but if you want to, I might be able to provide the opportunity for that. So um, here are our... That's our schedule. I would suggest you watch that schedule as we go. Okay, so here's a list of homework. We already talked about that. What I want to do now is I want to go to the vocabulary. Wow, this is a long list. So um, I'm just gonna bang this out literally in about 10 minutes. This is gonna go really fast. And then we're going to turn it over to Sophia to show you the kit. She has the full kit, show you the tote. She has a full tote. Um, and then we'll get back to uh, some theory and we'll get back to some more about the homework. So 
model rocketry versus high power rocketry. You may be familiar with model rockets. Um, you wanna hand me that model rocket, please? So basically model rockets are toys. They're toys for kids, shall we say? I, in your kit, there is a model rocket. This is what it looks like. It's got a parachute on it. It's got a nose cone on it. And the motors are about the size of, I described them as the size of your finger. So this is a, an SD's motor. This happens to be a B44. So B means a certain amount of fuel, basically. And four means the thrust. And then second four means the number of seconds until the ejection charge goes off. Those are toys for kids. Those are model rockets. And there is a model rocket in your tote, but I didn't give you everything you need to fly it. I didn't give you a motor. I didn't give you a, a igniters. I didn't give you a launch pad. You'll have to go out of your way a bit to fly that, but I, I would encourage you to actually at least look into it. On the other hand, switching from models to high power, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sharing. Because if I stop sharing, am I big in your screen? And if I'm not big, let me see if I can figure out how to make me big. Speaker, how about that? Yeah, go to view. Am I big in your screen now? now? Yeah. That's fine. Oddly enough, I'm not big in my own screen. But <laughs> too bad. So here I have a bunch of high power motors. So frankly, high power motors are bigger <laughs> and bigger. And so frankly, um, every time you change the letter, you essentially double the amount of fuel you have. This is approximate at least. And so model rockets A, and then there's B, which is twice as much, and C, which is twice as much as B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by the time you get to H, the government starts to worry about you because you have a lot of firepower literally in your hands. And so H is the beginning of high power. It's easy to remember, H or high power, H. Um, and then uh, twice as much of that would be I, twice as much as that is J. So for instance, of the things I have in front of me, there's an H motor. This happens to be an H 125. That's 125 Newtons of thrust. Um, and then if I dig a little more, there's a J. So this actually has about four times as much fuel as that very first one I showed you. Um, here's another J. So this particular one is a different diameter. And then these motors typically are, are flown inside of metal cases. And so the cases you reuse, but the, the motors themselves are burned one time. So this particular activity is to teach you to build and fly a rocket on an H motor, just to give you just to dabble a little tiny bit in high power. And you need to be certified to purchase such motors and fly them. And so what we're doing here is that you're flying under my certification, which is completely fine. On the other hand, if you want to get certified, you would need to build your own rocket, not as a team, but as an individual. Okay, so here's what I'm doing now. I'm literally running through very fast, faster than that, <laughs> uh, the things on my vocabulary list. So I talked about motor class. H is where high power starts. Um, let me show you, I do want to actually go back and share my screen and show you, uh, go back to that, where did it go? Here we go. This diagram, this basically shows how a rocket flight might proceed. So you launch it and your motor will boost. It will thrust for a relatively short time, maybe a second or two only, by which point you're going pretty fast. And then you will coast. You will continue coasting upwards until you reach apogee. That's the peak of your flight. And then at that point, the key is to get an explosion, possibly even more than one, so as to bring parachutes out of your rocket and help you land. So this figure shows a single parachute that brings the thing down. Another possibility, this is what we'll be doing in this particular uh, activity is building a dual deploy rocket, which basically means that you um, pull out a second parachute as you approach the ground and I call the main parachute and that allows you to land more, more gently. So the, the first parachute would typically be called the drogue. The second parachute would be called the main and ejection charges are explosive charges which go off one at apogee and another one perhaps as you approach the ground to bring these parachutes out of various parts of the rocket. An altimeter two, um, I'm just reading my list here. An altimeter two is some sort of a data logger and um, it's not a real altimeter. So a real altimeter is something that not only measures your altitude but also can call for explosive charges. And so 
Ravens, straddle loggers, there's many altimeters out there, but an altimeter too, despite the name, is not a real altimeter. It's just something that can measure altitude but can't really do anything about it. So what I want to do now is I want to take a quick look at my split rocket. I showed this to you, to some of you who are at North Branch. So I'm just going to take my, can you actually, here's what you want to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to watch over there and make sure I'm pointing it in a pseudo reasonable direction. Okay, so I have here a rocket that's actually been split lengthwise. Okay, and so this rocket, the first one I'm showing you. Um, so are you able to see my, this is the tail end. So here are the, the fins. This is where the motor would go. Uh, wow, this is a little tricky for me to see because you're small on my screen. <laughs> yeah, I um, can you make it bigger on my screen? How do you do that? So the, the idea is I'm the speaker, and so it's big on everybody else's screen, but it's never big on my screen, which is difficult. OK, I think this is a feature of Zoom. I would call it a bug, but anyway, that's fine. So in this particular rocket, you would have the motor would go here. And then the idea is the explosive charge would pressurize this part of the rocket and there is a single parachute here. And this parachute happens to be protected by a sliding piston, which is an interesting way to um, protect a parachute. We're not gonna do that on our, oh, thank you. How do you do that? Interesting. Okay, fair enough. So uh, this part of the rocket pressurizes and then the rocket actually breaks open right here and the upper part of the rocket, which is backwards, wow. Uh, this part of the rocket would separate, but it's tied together to the lower part of the rocket with this recovery harness here. So this is called a single deploy, a single parachute rocket. And then here is the same rocket, also split, but set up with two parachutes. So basically in this particular case, again, starting at the top, here's the nose cone, whoa, sorry. <laughs> Getting used to this pointing, there we go. Here's the nose cone. And then here's an upper section, which actually has a fairly large parachute. That's the parachute that will bring me down gently. And then I have some electronics in this section. And so the idea is this particular altimeter, which is a tiny device, will notice when I've reached apogee and fire one charge below to bring out a drogue parachute. And then when I get close to the ground, it will fire another charge above to bring out a main parachute, a bigger parachute. So down here is very much the same as the original rocket with a relatively small parachute ready to come out at apogee. And then here is the motor itself, happens to have two grains of propellant. You insert your igniter up to the top and then it burns out. And as it burns out, it thrusts down through the nozzle and it also burns slowly through this delay grain and eventually will cause an explosion here, which will also pressurize this area. That's an automatic way, but if I have electronics, I can use the electronics to pressurize this upper area. And then I'll have a backup. So I have a motor eject, it's called, as a backup. Okay, fine. So I pretty much uh, went through all of the parts in my vocabulary list. Let me just point out that this parachute, for instance, is protected with a flame protector. There's a quick link here, which allows it to become connected and disconnected easily right there. Um, and that will, that will do. The, uh, actually one more thing, and that is the outer part of the, the, the airframe, the outside of it is a specific diameter, sorry. And then inside is what's called a coupler tube, which is just, just large enough, just small enough, I guess, to barely fit inside of the airframe. And so you can use a coupler tube to keep two pieces of airframe lined up with each other. And in this particular case, the coupler tube actually has content. So that would be sort of a payload area, in this case, an avionics bay, where I'm gonna have things that make decisions about how the rocket is flying. Oh, a couple more things that I should show. I'm just looking back. Notice that there are certain places within the rocket that I have bulk plates that completely stop the entire cross-sectional area. Um, or way down here, I have some centering ring, 
which hold this motor mount tube in the center of the airframe. So in other words, this is almost like a bulk plate with a hole in it. The hole is designed to accommodate exactly the motor mount tube, which is where you mount your motor. We have fins at the back. We will not put forward fins on this particular, or any rocket for that matter, but those would be called, called canards. And yes, you should watch the animations. The animations are actually very cool in another document. They show how a model rocket motor burns from the back toward the front and how a high power rocket burns from the middle toward the outside. Um, in part because there's not enough surface area for getting high power out of ammonium perchlorate. You also have to be careful about motor retention. Essentially, when the motor is thrusting, it's pushing hard and it will try to penetrate the interior of the rocket and that would be bad. So make sure that you have a way to stop the rocket from going forward into the rest of the, I'm sorry, the motor from going forward into the rocket. But then when you explode things, then the, that wants to spit the motor back out again. So you have to make sure that you have retention to keep the rocket motor from getting spit out the back end. So you need forward and reverse retention and um, we'll talk about both. I showed you the propellant grains just a moment ago. And uh, let me show you one more thing. Here is a case. And in this case is in fact a spent motor. In this case, it's a four grain, 38 millimeter case. And so when you get a motor, this is basically what it will look like. There are grains inside of that. And so to get this prepared for flight, you would assemble it by putting it into the case, threading it in. Sometimes the threads are on the outside, some of the threads are on the inside. And then this is ready to burn. And then the explosive charge is up here, ready to explode and pressurize the upper part of the rocket. So that's called a reload in a case. You can also buy caseless motors. Let me see if I can find one. So a caseless motor essentially has the same diameter as the case. Um, so you just put this in your rocket and burn it and then throw the entire thing away. No case necessary, but uh, that means you also don't invest, shall we say, in the case and get to use it over and over again. Okay. It turns out that if the case is longer than the motor, you can actually fill up the open part of the case with what are called spacers. So my intention for this activity was actually, is actually to give you a three grain case and a two grain motor and a spacer. A three grain case is more useful than a two grain uh, case because it allows you to fly three grain motors as well. But for this activity, we'll fly a two grain motor. And so you'll be more prepared for future flights if you decide to stick with rocketry. I mentioned the fact that you have to protect your parachutes. In the case of the split rocket, the parachutes were protected with flame proof cloth. In the case of a model, it would typically, typically be protected with wadding or, or rocket barf, um, which is the cellulose product, which is actually favored by the Tripoli Minnesota Club. They'll even give you rocket barf if you show up with wadding. And then we will be building our rockets typically with epoxies of various sorts, two component epoxies, so the one we're gonna use is called rocket epoxy and it's a one-to-one -one mixture. Some other epoxies have different mixing ratios but one-to-one -one is the easiest of course, just scoop of A, scoop of B, mix them together. And um, we'll also uh, talk to you because it's in the kit about JB Weld. So JB Weld is a high temperature or high temperature tolerant epoxy. So that's useful for certain parts of the rocket that might get hot. Um, We'll talk a lot more next week about the idea of surface mounted fins and through hole fins. So for instance, the activity I want you to try is to take a tube and take something that looks a bit like a fin. It could be made of cardboard, for instance, and just see if you can glue it on the surface. That's considered surface mounting. On the other hand, with the rockets that I just showed you, the fins actually, let me show this to you. This is kind of important. The fins, there we go start out here, but they actually go inside. So they go through a, through a slot, a slot in the airframe, and then they get glued all the way into the motor mount tube as well as glued to the airframe. So this is significantly stronger than just having them attached to the outside surface. So um, that's gonna be important. And we will, on this kit that we're gonna be building, use through hole or through slot uh, fins. Make sure you always make things fit together before you do any gluing, that's called dry fitting. 
And then also be very thoughtful. Uh, Sophia is gonna help us a lot here to get the things glued in the right order because once you glue something, you can't <laughs> undo that. That's sort of a permanent step. Um, so I made it to the end of my list, except for CG, CP, and SM. So basically those are center of gravity, center of pressure, and static margin. And I'm gonna wait to talk about those because I want Sophia to have a chance to show us her kit and to show us her tote. Um, so we're just running through lots of things very fast. And right now we're going to take a quick look at the kit. And you have this rocket, this kit. There are a few parts that are still to come, but you basically have this kit. And uh, so let me just turn this around. And why don't you tell us what you got and go through it in whatever order seems appropriate. All right. So now would be a really good time to pull out your kit if you have it nearby and pull out parts along with me. So make sure you have everything. So your kit might be in a plastic bag. Yes, it is in a plastic garbage bag. Okay, it fine. It is not garbage, it is a rocket. So I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. So this is actually a part you guys don't have at the moment. So this is the lower body tube. As you can see, it has the fin slots um, pre-made for you. Um, we had to get this new part since um, we ordered the wrong kit. So we had wrong slot sizes, but you guys will get that soon enough. And what is this material? This is phenolic. phenolic yes. Yep. So phenolic is sort of a souped up cardboard. This is kind of the least expensive material for building this kind of rocket. You can go more expensive if you want to, but this is a good place to start. Yeah. You typically use canvas phenolic on the rocket team, which is similar, but if you tried to you know, squish it down, you definitely could not. But here you can still kind of get the little bit of flimsiness, but it's still hard and tough. Okay, so that's the bottom of the rocket. That's Go the ahead. Of the rocket. And then with this kit, we do have something uh, called the avionics bay. Um, and that is the uh, air, the outside of that is composed of two couplers and then a thick uh, outer band. So obviously right now it's all empty, but you'll insert part of the coupler here. And this thick band will actually be kind of the middle of the avionics bay. This will go over. And then we have the other half of the avionics bay going up here. So this is a particularly long avionics bay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, so I think it's about 12 inches, which, given the amount of electronics we have for this rocket, it's kind of excessive, but at least you can kind of see what it's like. And um, in the end, this band will actually be epoxied on, so you won't be able to move it, but it will insert into the lower body tube just like this. And then lastly, for, as far as the airframe goes, we have the upper body tube, um, same sort of phenolic, um, but no slots this time because there's no pins. Uh, just one more part like this up here. Maybe. Pretty tight fit between the coupler and the airframe. Then we have our nose cone um, that is already made for us and it has an attachment point here. I think we'll end up using an eye bolt. We're not going to use that attachment point. That will be a modification we'll make to the kit, but uh, we'll get there next week. Yeah. Um, but then that pops in right here. So that's the entire outer section of the rocket. So there is that's the size of the rocket we're building. And then where are the fins? Where are the fins? So that will be in the separate, uh, one of the separate plastic bags that you receive. Um, don't think you guys have exactly this. Um, so your, your fins are yet to come, but the fins are on this. So, yeah. so there they are. That's what they look like. Yeah, I can open them up. And then those fins will stick in those, inside those slots. So we're given three pre-cut fins. Good. Which will ultimately just slide right in there. Eventually, just go straight in there. It's kind of a snug fit, but that's good. 
Okay, and then there will be a motor mount tube that goes inside there to hold the motor and you'll use centering rings to hold that in place. Mm -hmm. so there's the motor mount tube. And I also see some centering rings. I see some bulk plates, which will be used at either end of the av bay. What's the, this portion here, you see uh, we'll end up using a lot of this material to build the fin can assembly, which consists of the motor mount tube. Uh, three centering rings that are actually cut for you. These will go on, there will be an aft thrust ring and centering ring, as well as a forward centering ring. And these centering rings are what will ultimately hold this motor mount in place when it is actually in the rocket. And center it, as you and, might imagine. Right. <laughs> Um, and these centering rings will also come in handy when aligning the fins. So if you, I guess you guys haven't seen the instructions yet because they're not in the kit, um, but the order of epoxy is really important at this step because we'll actually begin with epoxy on these two aft rings and get it perfectly uh, flush with the end of the rocket. And then what we do is we slide this forward centering ring on kind of as a way to ensure that our pins are exactly where they should be and are at the exact position. And then we tack the pins on and then we actually pull the pin can out and then glue the centering ring on. It turns out the order in which you do that is different and exactly opposite that for other rockets. And yes. so we have to pay close attention our intention is to mostly follow the instructions as given, but to make some modifications where we think we can improve on the instructions as given. So much more about that next week. Yes. So, but you get the idea, that's the size of the rocket we're building. I think it's what, 52 inches long or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is a sizable rocket, mm -hmm. um, but not a very heavy rocket, which is good because we're not using a particularly powerful motor, just an H motor. So it won't go that high, but we'll simulate how high it goes. Uh, in a future lesson. On the other hand, let's jump straight into the tote. So let's talk through, these are the things that are in your tote. There's a little uh, checklist here. Um, so you also a good time to open up your own tote and pull things out as I talk about them. So the first two things are the textbooks. So we have model rocketry, design and construction, the tote design, model rocketry. And then we have the high power rocketry book. Um, if your school has participated in online lessons like this before, you may not have received these as you probably already have them from previous lessons. So if you don't have them in your tote, please uh, check with your advisor or mentor and see where they might be. Um, so then we have those books. Next, I'm going to pull out uh, a model rocket right here. You should have all the parts for that, uh, but it's super glue as well as uh, SD's motors and a launch pad are not included if you plan to launch it um, yourself. So just, I mean, we gave you a model. I would suggest you build the model, but we did not give you everything you need to actually fly it. Uh, when I've done these lessons before, we've sometimes built this model and flown it at North Branch in one sitting, but I decided not to keep us at North Branch quite so long this time. Here's approximately what it would look like. Here is a launcher with the electronics necessary and a rod. Um, and there's, that's what that rocket looks like. And the uh, motor goes in the bottom, the parachute goes in the middle, the uh, nose cone goes on the top, of course. And then these uh, motors, these model rocket motors have a built-in ejection charge. So we would not be putting in our own explosives. But um, anyway, you can be in touch with us if you are, have questions about what it would take to launch that. You don't need to launch that any specific place, unlike high power rockets where you do have to take them to a place like North Branch that has FAA clearance for launching. So what else is in here? So we also have a four foot parachute. Um, so this could act as our main parachute. It's not exactly the perfect size, but it was what we put in everyone's kit and run around. Next, we have a flame protection for your parachute as you want to protect them from any ejection charges that go off in the rocket because you don't want your parachute on fire. Um, so you should have two different sizes. 
Uh, one is like a black color, it's a little bit smaller. And then there's a little bit bigger one, which is like a dark blue. So the kit came with one small drogue parachute. I'm giving you a parachute that is appropriate for Maine. Yeah, so this yellow one is what came in the kit itself, um, but that's the only type of parachute that was included in that. And they're not all yellow. Yes, they're not all yellow. Okay, let's go. And then next you have a bag of forged eyeballs, uh, quick links, nylon inserts. Um, my bag looks a little bit different because I have some different shapes, but you should have uh, a plastic baggie with all the stuff included. Then there's going to be an itty bitty bag filled with rivets and tear pins. Um, as you can see there, it's a very tiny bag. You might have to hunt for it, but you should have um, five of six of each. Six rivets and six chickens. We'll talk later about when to use which type. And then you should have two of these small yellow, or no, white uh, blocks. These are your terminal blocks, which would be used for ejection charges. Then we have another uh, Ziploc baggie of zip ties. And you should have some long ones as well as some shorter ones. Next, we have a nine volt battery. This will be used in your avionics bay. And then you should also have two um, CPVP caps. Um, so I have a baggie with two of them in, but you guys will have two separate baggies with one each in there. Um, these will be used in our uh, on our avionics bay. They're kind of like a cup that can hold your ejection charge. Um, just so you don't have like a black powder charge flying around your rocket. This is a nice way to keep it uh, a little bit neater. So you should have two of those. Next, we have our, our audio siren. So uh, we have the both parts uh, taped together, but when they're pulled apart and when it's on, um, it'll have a beeping siren. And that just helps you locate your rocket a little bit easier um, when it's deployed so you, you can at least hear it. And know where it's going. Next, you have an altimeter chip. So that should already be in the package. Um, this is not used for our ejection charges, but instead is just um, for measuring pressure or altitude. Yeah. It'll give you your performance characteristics like time of flight, how high you went, how fast you went, what acceleration you experienced. Then you will have uh, three sheets of sandpaper as well, all different grits. We have a pretty coarse one in the middle and then finer. And then something missing from my kit uh, is a tack cloth, which we'll use just for general cleaning and dusting after you sand your rocket, um, as well as a uh, painter's tape for uh, any Anytime you need tape during this, uh, I don't have those in my kit, but you guys should have them. Then we have sheets of parchment paper. Um, you can use that when using epoxy uh, just to keep surfaces from getting all sticky. So we have a couple sheets of those. Then we have our kit of rocket epoxy. You'll be using that for most of or pretty much all of when you need to glue things. Um, so you can see there's two different parts. Um, we'll talk about it a, a little bit later, but you'll need to uh, have equal parts of this stuff and this stuff. Uh, so there's the hardener and the resin. So part A is the resin and then part B is the hardener. Um, and additionally, you have gloves, Dixie cups and popsicle sticks. So when you're working with this um, glue, you should definitely be wearing gloves. Um, what I like to do is um, add equal parts of A and B to a Dixie cup um, and mix it around with popsicle sticks. Um, to make sure it's all nice and mixed before using it. And there are two plastic spoons. Uh, we can usually use these to make uh, external fillets in our rocket a little bit nice looking um, as it's round and you can use it to smooth out the glue. Then we also have JB Weld, which is a nice uh, glue to have on high temperature areas. So if you glued anything, maybe around the motor mount, um, 
it would be a good idea to have this stuff since it, it gets to be a really high temperature there and you obviously don't want things melting around there. Then we also have a retractable knife set or a box cutter. You should have, looks like a big one and a small one. Then we just have a screwdriver set with a couple uh, different bits. Those will be necessary for your altimeter because your altimeter will have very tiny screw heads on it. So you'll need a very tiny screwdriver. Yes. And then here we have a tape measure. And lastly, a sizzle should be included in your kit. So that's what's in the kit so far. It turns out that there's a bunch of things that are not in the kit. And um, I'll just tell you what some of those are. They're all they're in the, uh, the list of parts. So you can actually go and see what they're going to look like. A few of them are not in the kit because I've ordered them and they haven't arrived. And a few of them are not in the kit because I'm planning to lend them to you and not give them to you. And so I will give them to you at the launch site and I won't give them to you in advance. These include the altimeter itself. I'm gonna send you some wire. So basically you'll need wire for wiring up your ab bay. I will, I will definitely send you some wire and I'll send you the altimeters when they arrive, but they haven't arrived yet. Some battery holders for nine volt batteries. The cases, I talked about a three grain case and a spacer. The motor itself, which I won't give to you because you're not allowed to have those unless you're certified. So they need to stay in my possession until we're together to fly these things, as well as the ejection or so the E matches, which will fire the ejection charges, the ejection charges themselves. I will also provide those to you when we're together for the launch. Um, I don't have one with me, but there's a photograph of it in that document that shows a radio beeper. We might put beepers on these things. If you go higher than 3,000 feet, you're required to by the AAA Minnesota. Um, uh, club um, and uh, styrofoam packing peanuts is one way we, if we put things inside our nose cones, which we sometimes do, we put styrofoam in there to keep them from rattling around. Um, if you're interested in flying a camera, I would be willing to lend you a camera. And then um, I don't think I have one, but I have a photograph of it, a camera mount that you can glue it to the outside of your rocket so as to place the camera in it. And um, those are 3D printed. And so either you can print yours yourself, we can send you the files if you're interested, um, or we could probably print them and send you the whole thing if you really need, if you don't have 3D printers available. But then the cameras themselves, this is optional, but the cameras themselves we would lend to you. And then I'm not providing a spray paint for painting your rocket, but I do hope you take the time to prepare your rocket to paint it. Ooh, one thing I also didn't provide, but you might want to make is, <laughs> I've been using it all along. It's called a cradle. So the cradle is here. So basically this is just made of PVC. Here's an X piece, here's corner pieces. This is half inch PVC. So two sections that are that long, four sections that are this long on each end. Um, these are kind of optional, but this is a nice way to hold a rocket. So for instance, you might want to make yourself a cradle and then you can put rockets in it, whether you're holding them there for display purposes or for preparation for launch or for drawing or whatever. So anyway, um, a PVC cradle, I did not provide one, but they're easy to make and I would encourage you to consider making one. That's it. I have a last list. This is also on the document that says, here are some things that you probably could benefit from having uh, as far as tools. And um, they include a fine tip, permanent marker, pliers, a wire stripper, a multimeter might be useful, safety glasses, especially when you're using power tools and the power tools would be something like a Dremel tool for whether a rotating cutter tool of some sort, a drill with drill bits going down to like a 16th of an inch would be useful to have. These are things that pretty much everybody has around. You may not have them all in one place right now. Um, and then a scale. So as to be able to measure the weights of things especially a scale that goes down to maybe the, the, the gram level, not necessarily the tenths or hundreds of grams, but something that you can tell the difference between 123 grams and 142 grams. Okay, so um, those are things that would be useful to have around. You can get by without a scale, um, but you probably can't get by without a drill, for instance. Um, someone was asking about when are the fins coming? I, I did receive those in the mail uh, yesterday. And so I'm planning to try to mail those out to you tomorrow. Uh, the fins and uh, the instructions and the decals, although I'm not necessarily expecting these teams, you guys will necessarily choose to um, use the decals that are provided. You can, but you don't have to. Okay, fine. 
we're getting close to the end here. Wow. So I just wanted to um, point out the following theory items that I think you should be thinking about. Okay. So first of all, one thing that's very important for a rocket, theoretically, uh, is for the rocket to want to fly forward, nose first. Okay. And so um, one way to tell if a rocket is stable, as in it wants to fly nose first, is to notice where is its gravitational balance point. And you can find that just by balancing it on your finger if it's not too big. Um, so I'll call that the center of gravity or the center of mass, CG or C, uh, CM. Probably we usually call it CG in, in rocketry circles. And then comparing that to the center of pressure. Now the center of pressure is very much the same concept, except it's not the center of gravitational force, it's the center of air force. And you can imagine as a rocket flies, the air acts on it. And so I'll be interested in two things. One is the fact that there's drag on the rocket. And so that's fair enough. That's axial, that's essentially down the rocket. I'm mostly interested in the sideways air forces. And so I will pretty much ignore the, 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 the axial air forces and think about the CP and calculate only the sideways air forces. And then I wanna make sure that the CP is, gotta get this right now, help me out here, forward of or aft of the CG? Oh, CP I, should be aft of CG. Okay, fine, thank you. I'm just rusty on this stuff, sorry about that. Okay, so here's a rocket. And so I didn't put the parachute in, but basically this thing has a, a CG about here. This is its balance point. And its CP, its pressure center point, will be dominated by the fin. So frankly, way back here. So the idea is as the rocket flies, it will have a tendency to pivot about the CG. But the thing that makes it pivot is air forces acting on the fins. And so what I want to do is as the air strikes the fins, I want it to always push it back so as to keep the nose going upwards. So since, uh, the SM, the static margin, is just a measurement of how far it is from the CG to the CP in units of diameters. And so what we want to do is make sure that the CP is farther aft by at least one diameter, preferably by maybe two diameters or three diameters even. Okay, so the, uh, the slides that I have posted, I would encourage you to look at that. And there's even a, a hand calculation of CG, which will look familiar if you're a physics type, and CP, which will look less familiar, but sort of familiar. And then SM is a trivial calculation, just Look at those two answers and see how far apart they are in diameters. If your static margin is negative, you are unstable and your rocket will tend to tumble. This is not good. If your static margin is between zero and one, you are stable, but only moderately so. And so we really want our static margin to be one or maybe two or maybe three. On the other hand, if your static margin is five or 10, then you will really be, you'll tend to fly into the wind. And so if there's a sideways wind, you will promptly start flying sideways. That's also not so good. So that's called overstable. So we really wanna aim for a static margin in the vicinity of from maybe one to three. And um, the good news is you don't have to calculate these things for yourself because when we use simulation programs, they will calculate them for us. But I think it's always a good idea to understand what these calculations are doing in part so you can tell if the simulation is doing something really dumb. And usually that happens if you enter something wrong, or if you, you, know, you inadvertently chose you know, uh, something made of lead and you didn't realize that it was way heavier than you thought it was going to be. And, um, and then the calculation will come up with a really dumb answer and you should be able to catch that and then try to figure out why it happened and see if you can fix it. So I would suggest you take a look at the slides I've posted about CG, CP and SM. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about how we'll use free software program to calculate these things for us automatically so you don't have to lose sleep over it. Can I really calculate that? I just want you to appreciate what that calculation is doing for you. Okay, so that's really all the theory I'm gonna do. That was only six minutes or less. Amazing. Here is the homework. I already mentioned this. The homework besides taking a look at the, the homework listing and doing the reading and going through your tote, okay? And, and looking at the CGCP slides is to try to play with some epoxy. And when I say play with it, I don't mean throw it at your classmates, but rather mix up some epoxy, perhaps just one scoop, maybe use those spoons, maybe for scooping for the moment, um, and do two things with it. One is I want you to take a piece of cardboard. So here is actually a piece of cardboard from a, for, for a model rocket actually, or maybe this is even a motor mount tube. 
And then take something that you can cut into a fin. This happens to be a piece of very thin wood, but you could do this with cardboard. Um, you could, do I have one around here? Just use a toilet paper tube, it doesn't really matter, okay? So frankly, find yourself some tube of cardboard type material um, and something that could be a fin, that could also be cardboard, but it should be flat, and see how well you can glue on your fins. In particular, maybe even try to glue on four and get them to be exactly lined up and exactly spaced out and uh, very neatly glued on. And you might find that it's not that easy. Um, on the other hand, this is surface mount. Eventually we'll do through hole, which is even less easy, but uh, we'll talk about that in more detail. So practice with the epoxy a little tiny bit. Similarly, I, I think you should, after you mix the epoxy, uh, Sophia was telling me you should mix rock epoxy for maybe a minute or so pretty thoroughly. And then you might have up to perhaps 20, 30 minutes to use it before it starts to get stiff. I would suggest you stir it every five minutes for at least an hour and just see how it stiffens up to understand whether or not you really need to use it right away or not. And in general, only mix up what you're gonna use and then use it right away. So um, just get used to this epoxy and what it does after you've mixed it, because once it gets hard, you can't use it and you have to throw it away and start over again. You have plenty of epoxy for one rocket. If you're gonna build several rockets, maybe not so much. Which brings me to the following point. If you have a lot of people interested the lessons, that's great, but you might have more people than you really want to put on one rocket build. Hey, I'm giving you the stuff for one rocket, but uh, I suppose if you really had a lot of interest and maybe some resources, you could buy more kits, either this kit or a different kit, like that Arcus kit or that Miranda kit, and get other people to build a different rocket. You might need more epoxy um, just to get more experience on your team. That's what I'm going to stop with. And I only have supposedly two minutes left, but um, I'm happy to take questions right now. And if this has to run over 7.30, you're welcome to step away. But for now, we're done with our presentation and would be happy to handle any questions about what we've talked about or logistics. Uh, Kelly Valen, IHCC. I'm just curious. You just want us to, you don't want us to actually build anything necessarily, just get used to the, the kit and the products. Good point. Okay, we really actually don't want you to follow the instructions and start building the real rocket. And here's why. We want, I want Sophia to have a chance to tell you how it went when she built hers. Let her build hers first. Don't worry, she'll, she'll keep ahead of you. So uh, next week, she'll talk to you through the beginning steps and she will have already done them. And then after next week, you can do some of the beginning steps, but why don't you just hold off? You've got other things to do, reading and some theory to look at. Why don't you hold off on doing any real final permanent building of the actual kit, even once you have the fins in place, but you can certainly look at the instructions. And if you have issues or questions about the instructions, you should by all means bring them to our attention before you make a mistake, frankly. Other questions? Okay, uh, you're welcome to keep in touch with us, either of us uh, by um, email would be best. But phone if you if you really have something quite pressing like it's drying oh my god i better call them that can happen um but uh our intention is to have the same meeting this same time next week and the first thing we're going to do next week is say hold up your fin can we want you to do this and so we're going to actually ask you show us what you've done and tell us how it went next week first thing um and then we'll dive right into actually talking through the full build so that you then over the next three weeks approximately can fully build the entire rocket while we in our lesson do other things like talk about simulations, talk about other theory, talk about um, other things that are important, including wiring a bad bay. So that's what it looks like. Last call for questions tonight. Okay, seeing them, uh, thanks for your attention. Um, Keep in touch and we have now all addresses. Yes, we have all addresses. So I will be trying to get things in the mail for you tomorrow. So they should be in your hands before we meet next time. Uh, that will just be the final parts for the kit. You already have a bunch of the parts for the kit and this will be the final few parts and the instructions for the kit, but I've already posted the instructions. So you don't even need those. You can start reading those anytime. Have a good night. Uh, James, I do have a, just a side question for you. Go ahead. Um, are you keeping, is that the container behind you that you're keeping the, the motors in? The one on the chair to your right? 
or do you have a place that you're keeping them like the I, I, I was under the understanding that it had to be an ATF thing if you were keeping them longer than a day. Uh, we should probably talk about this some other time, but but in actuality, I brought these down from my storage area, so that's what they're in right now. Gotcha. Um, and, and that's not a that's not a certified storage mechanism. I will agree. Um, <laughs> I was just curious. I wasn't pointing anything out. I was just uh, I thought I read it, that somewhere. No, it turns it turns out that uh, igniters are federally mandated to be kept in very specific areas and motors less so interestingly enough for reasons oh, that are a little hard to understand um but no it's a good idea these are definitely flammable items and it would be a good idea to keep them once you have them but you don't have them uh but to keep them in a place that is not going to be on fire at any time or close to any uh, ignition sources gotcha any other questions Okay, so I will call it a night and I will look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.